Attention, launch on the first channel. Launch. Closing in. Target destroyed. Confirmed. Greetings to all free people, this is Army TV. Today we're visiting the 39th Anti-Aircraft Missile Regiment, and we'll be talking with the crew operating the OSA surface-to-air missile system. This particular system has been modified by Poland. What exactly sets it apart from the old Soviet version? We're about to find out. Poland replaced the camera on this vehicle. They added a night mode. That gives us the ability to detect and visually assess drones at night. Before, at night, we worked only off radar marks just blips. Now the camera comes on, night mode activates, and we can clearly see whether it's an Orlin, a Shahed, or just a small reconnaissance bird. They also changed the control system for the antenna launcher unit, the whole top assembly. They added a joystick. And now the deputy chief of the crew can control the entire vehicle alone, directly from inside the cabin, both azimuth and elevation. That lets us switch to combat readiness faster, and also drop back to readiness level 3 faster when needed. Another big change, the encryption unit was replaced. The old Soviet one was removed, and a Polish encryptor was installed. And what does that give you? What are the real advantages? We're a bit harder to see. Not dramatically, but it matters. The enemy gets less radar return from us. Lower emission, weaker signal going back to their radar. That gives us an edge. Can you show us your workstation where the actual control happens? Is it right here? Yes. Come on, I'll go first. And this is the joystick you were talking about, right? Yes, this is the joystick I mentioned. The camera was upgraded. This is the night vision feed. Everything from the camera is transmitted right here to this screen. Here we see the number of missiles, the system readiness status. Here it shows that a missile is ready to launch. It also shows when a target enters the engagement zone. The lower display shows what happens after missile launch. The missile leaves the rail, locks onto the target, enters the guidance beam, and K3 detonates. Target destroyed. Launching the system starts with power and circuit checks. We verify voltage to make sure everything is stable. Once that's confirmed, we bring the machine online and go to work. You know, you've got a lot of toggle switches in here. I once filmed the Gephard and there everything was labeled in German. Even the crew commander had gone through and hand labeled things with a marker, just so in a critical moment he could react instantly. Looks like the Poles did the labeling here. Yeah, it looks like the Poles labeled this one too. When you receive a combat order, when there's an incoming target, how does your work actually start? The vehicle powers up, and we're past the target coordinates. This radar up top, the one that's constantly rotating, feeds everything down here as contact points. Those points give us the target azimuth, say 270 degrees, and range, for example, 10 kilometers, about 6.2 miles. We lock that range in, see? Range 10 kilometers per hour, azimuth 270 degrees, that's the target. We see it, a track mark appears. We take it, switch on the camera. We now have azimuth, range, and elevation angle. Elevation is altitude, how high the target is above us. We report it, identify what kind of target we're dealing with. Then we switch to combat mode. We wait until the indicator lights up, launch ready. And then, on the crew chief's command, we turn the key and press the launch button. Support the channel with a like and subscribe. And that's when the missile goes. Yes, the launch happens. The missile leaves the rail, separation confirmed. We get lock on, then guidance, medium beam, narrow beam. As the missile closes on the target, the K3 light comes on. That means target destroyed. When it's raining, you have to use moving target selection. That lets us filter out rain and clouds, clean the picture, and see the target better. We once worked during a heavy downpour, real rainstorm, shayheads were coming in. For about five minutes, we couldn't get a solid lock. Then we enabled moving target selection, picked the shayheads up cleanly, and destroyed them.
Closing in. Target destroyed. Confirmed. There are moments when, after launch, we see the target pulling away and we're running out of range. Standard engagement range is around 10 kilometers, roughly 10.3 kilometers at the edge. For the system, that's already a control limit. Beyond that, the vehicle is not supposed to fire. But we've had moments where we launched at 10.5 kilometers and destroyed targets at 11 kilometers, 12 kilometers, even 12.5 to 12.9 kilometers. You're not supposed to do that. But there were critical situations when that target was causing serious trouble and it had to be taken out. And in those moments, we pushed the system beyond its limits. Over the course of your service, how many targets has your crew taken down? 140. One Su Series fighter aircraft destroyed, two other Sukhois engaged, two Orion strike UAVs destroyed, cruise missiles, Shaheds, and various reconnaissance drones. That's just 140 confirmed kills that are officially recorded. At the start of the war, nobody was filming anything. Nobody was recording video. You just put a check mark in a notebook, destroyed, and that was it. So you're basically the one constantly pulling the trigger and knocking these targets down. What does it feel like when you score a kill? What's going on inside you? The first 10 kills. Pure adrenaline. Real euphoria. Right now, it's over 160 launches. 140 confirmed destructions. But still, every destroyed target, it's a rush, right? Yeah, it's a hell of a rush. Tell me, how do the Russians actually operate? Do they probe our air defense, try to feel it out? A lot of fake targets. Electronic warfare is constantly in play. You get a huge number of false returns popping up on the detection screen. To confuse you? Yes, but when EW is spoofing, the target doesn't actually move. The blip is there, but it just sits in place. When a Shahed is flying though, it's different. The speed is high, and you can clearly see the track. The mark moves along the azimuth, or you see it closing the distance. So that's how you tell a real target from a fake one. These days, what helps the most is the EO slash TV channel that came with the Polish upgrades. It shows targets much better than what we had before on the old Soviet version. There were situations like this. They'd send in one reconnaissance drone. We'd shoot it down. Then two more would come in. We'd take those out. Then more would follow. They don't really use sophisticated tricks, but they do like to wear you down. Now, this is the operator's workstation. The operator is responsible for locking the target by range. This is the senior operator's position. He's responsible for antenna tuning and detecting the target on the scope. This is the deputy chief's seat. He helps the guys with identification and executes the launch. The commander sits where you're sitting now. He conducts objective control and handles the radio traffic. And this is the driver mechanic's position. Hello? This is the most important man we've got. He has to get us in, move us out, maintain the vehicle, start the turbine, start the engine, drive in, reposition, and camouflage the system. He's a rock-solid guy. We had a driver mechanic once. We were in active combat. We launched, destroyed the target, and at that exact moment, we got hit with BM-27 Urigan MLRS fire. Our driver didn't hesitate for a second. He slammed it into gear, laying across the crew chief's position, floored the gas, and drove. Cluster munitions from the Oregon were falling all around the vehicle, and he was still pulling us out. In that position, he drove about 4 kilometers, roughly 2.5 miles, and got us clear. That's the kind of people who save a crew's lives. How long does someone need to train to work with this system? We had an operator come to us. He was from a guard platoon, knew absolutely nothing about air defense. They transferred him to us, put him straight into the vehicle. Three months later, he was already working. There's nothing impossible here. You can learn anything. The main thing is that people come willing to learn, and we'll teach them.